issues that are that are really thorny. And trying to put myself in your shoes, I imagine that um, basically uh, you're trying to keep this from happening. Is my uh, concept of, of why you're here? And um, and okay. You know, figuratively speaking, because you're probably not actually dealing with kudzu, right? But everybody loves to put up kudzu when they want to show a bad invasion. Um, you're, so you're already dealing with this issue. And then you hear about this. And that obviously can't be good either, right? And that's, of course, also figuratively speaking, fortunately. Um, so, so what do we do? So, uh, well, let's talk. Um, Basically, I think we can look at this through a, a variety of lenses. First off, we've got some environmental challenges that we're dealing with, like invasive species. Then we've got some potentially depressing environmental trends on top of them. Um, and one of these could make the other one even worse. Uh, so either you're heading for the exits or you're calling your therapist or you're going to sit here and figure out what we can do about all this. And I think there are things you can do, but um, but you know, it's a little bit frustrating as some of these problems are off in the future and we have to, to prepare for them, basically, as opposed to doing a whole lot right now. So environmental challenges on the landscape, how do you manage the good biodiversity that's, that's there, the species that you want? Um, how do you deal with invasive species? Which species do you focus your time on? How do you manage them uh, on a limited budget? Uh, those are all important questions that, that we have to deal with. Uh, so today I'm going to start out by going through some of these environmental trends that we're experiencing, um, give a little bit more detail on what changes we're expecting to see. And uh, I'm the, the director of the Purdue Climate Change Research Center. Uh, we're based in Indiana. And one of the things we're in the middle of right now is the Indiana Climate Change Impacts Assessment. And and so we're thinking about this a lot in Indiana right now and thinking about specifically how our climate's going to change. And it turns out the way that the climate's going to change in Indiana is very similar to the way the climate's going to change here in the Northeast. Um, and I mean, they're relatively close, but in some parts of the country, there are steep gradients in what you expect from climate change. But so I'm going to show you expectations for Indiana that are very, very similar to what is going to, what we think is going to occur here. Um, one thing that's not going to be different by location is that CO2 concentrations are increasing. And of course, plants respond to increased CO2. So that's, uh, that's an issue. Um, of course, it's getting warmer. And I'll show you a little bit more about uh, how and why that matters. It's getting wetter in this part of the world. It's already getting wetter. And the rain's coming in larger events, so more extreme precipitation. Um, and that trend is expanding expected to continue, although it's not just a simple trend. Um, there are some subtleties to it that are important. Um, and then basically just all hell's breaking loose with other global environmental changes, right? So we've got nitrogen depositions, so we're fertilizing our ecosystems accidentally, which favors some of the faster growing species. Habitats are continuing to be fragmented in some places, although that's pretty thoroughly done here. Um, Fire frequencies are changing. That's not such an issue in the Northeast as it is elsewhere, but, but some managers have to be thinking about this. Um, but, you know, on the bright side, acid rain is getting better. So at least you can look to that and say some pollution controls are doing their job. Um, okay, so the, the CO2 thing, you, you already know that CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, but it's kind of staggering how quickly that's happening. So. Here you're seeing CO2 concentration for the last 6,000 years, and then more recently, um, and just to give you a sense of scale, here's my grandfather. He was born when CO2 concentrations were barely above the long-term sort of average, right? By the time my dad was born, they were fairly substantially uh, above that. Um, by the time I was born, we were up around, what, 310 plus parts per million? And then my son was born way up higher, and, and we're shooting up well above 400 now. Um, we've increased CO2 concentrations by more than 43%, more than 44% in the atmosphere at this point. Um, and we don't notice it, right? From day to day, uh, in our day to day lives, we don't notice that at all. If, if CO2 was not a colorless gas, if it was something we could see, this would be crazy, right? My grandfather would say, 
uh, well, back when I was born, he's not alive anymore, but he'd say, you know, back when I was born, the sky was orange, right? And then, like, my dad would say, oh, no, it was yellow or something, right? And then I'd say, no, it was green. My son would say, well, it's blue. So, um, but we don't notice it. We don't notice this massive change in CO2, but the plants definitely notice it, right? They're already growing better um, in some places, at least. Um, and, and evolutionarily speaking, this is a huge change. It's not just 6,000 years. The CO2 concentration has been this high in more than 800,000 years. Um, we know that from the bubbles trapped in ice cores. We can suck CO2, we can suck air out of these little tiny bubbles and see what the CO2 concentration was in them. Um, so this is just a, a really massive and dramatic change in the atmosphere that, that our ecosystems are all experiencing over a short period of time here. Um, and if we just focus on, on the little black rectangle up there, that time frame, um, that CO2 concentration increase is shown by the white line here. And now we're also seeing the temperature change on the planet, global average temperature, surface temperature change. Um, and you see that it's going up, not necessarily in lockstep exactly, there's a lot of noise but it's going up at the same time. And, uh, and we know now that, that it's going up largely because of the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. And, and the temperature is rising here in this part of the, the world, not just as a global average. So this is uh, looking back over uh, more than 100 years. Um, and this is the average surface temperatures in Indiana. Um, over this long time period, the temperatures have gone up by 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the increase has been faster over the last 50 years or so. Um, now, you'll notice there's a lot of year-to-year -year variations. So this is a long-term trend. It's still relatively small if you look at the average, but it is a long-term trend that's happening. And I'll talk in a little while about why averages are not maybe the best way to look at this. Um, Total precipitation is increasing too, and the change in Indiana is about the same as what uh, as what you've seen here, as well as the, the projected change is about the same. So it's been increasing over time against a background of a lot of year-to-year -year variability. Um, the increase has been faster in recent years, and what that adds up to in different parts of our state is, you know, anywhere between a seven inch per year increase and a three or three and a half inch per year increase, depending on, on where you are. So these are actually substantial increases in, in precipitation. If we look towards the future at what our climate might feel like, um, and whether it will feel like the, the climate that exists somewhere else right now, so, so what would, in the summer, what will our climate feel like in the future? Um, it depends on the emission we have as a society and as a globe. Um, but, you know, our climate of Indiana is headed south, just as yours is here in the northeast. It's getting warmer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's going to get warmer no matter what the emissions scenario is. We basically, there's, there's, in my opinion, no chance that we're not going to have a decent chunk of warming, a biologically important amount of warming by the middle of this century. Um, what happens by the end of the century sort of depends a lot more strongly on our emissions. So in Indiana, we might be experiencing the, the climate of South Texas by the end of the century if we stick with sort of the business as usual emission scenario. Um, but, you know, I think the message that's important for, for uh, people anywhere in the U.S. is that, that we're going to get uh, – important changes in our climate in the coming few decades that we need to be preparing for no matter what the emission scenario is that you're looking at. If we reduce emissions now, uh, that's going to make a difference for the end of the century, but we have to be preparing for things now. So I've talked a bit about averages so far, but really, um, in reality, all of us manage our lives in terms of the seasonality of climate and the extremes in climate, right? If you live next to a stream, you don't care so much what the average stream level is. Um, but if it gets an inch higher at all times, you really care about that one that floods. And um, 
So the, the timing is important in places like Indiana and the Northeast when we think about precipitation changes. We're going to get likely a bit more rainfall in these areas, but, um, but that rainfall is mainly going to come in the winter and spring. Um, and so that has the potential to lead to runoff issues and erosion um, in these times of year when the plants aren't really using the moisture much. And it could become even drier effectively. The soils could become drier in the summer and fall because there will be more water demand from the plants. So this is changing the competitive environment that plants are existing in. This is changing water flows in aquatic ecosystems. Um, it's potentially leading to runoff in the spring when uh, fields have been fertilized and uh, leading to eutrophication of, uh, of streams and, and downstream environments. If we think about extremes, um, when you get a small change in the average temperature, your distribution of different temperatures or um, a whole variety of things, but we're looking at temperature here, your distribution changes so that suddenly your extreme hot temperature becomes much hotter. What's an extreme hot temperature now comes much more frequently. And the extreme cold temperatures that you experience every once in a while just don't really happen anymore. And that's important for thinking about the species that we will have here, the species that we'll need to be managing in the future. Um, when we think about this sort of personally, how extremes might affect us, we might think about the, the hot temperatures the most. And so in Indiana, we might think about hot summers. And now where I'm from in, in West Lafayette, Indiana, we have, we have 20 days per year that are 90 degrees or more. Um, on average, but we're looking at by the middle of this century um, Basically three times that and so this is an example of where the, the temperature increase may not look that dramatic But when you look at some of the extremes it becomes more dramatic um, So This also is the case if you look at, at cold temperatures and we'll get to that in, in just a minute um, So the the question is um, you know, will all of these sorts of environmental trends make invasive species issues even worse? Um, well, we can expect that we may see more invasive species arrive, we may see ranges of invasive species expand, the, the interactions of those species with native species are going to change in different ways, so we have to be thinking about that, and that could be uh, competitive interactions, it could be herbivory or predation. Um, it, the, at the same time, the, the impacts of the invasive species may change, and the value of the invaded ecosystem may change in some ways. And I'll give you examples of, of these different um, sorts of shifts that we're, uh, that we're expecting. So this is a graph that shows you the coldest temperature of the year. You may not be able to see what it says at the top. It's coldest temperature of the year. So this is the, think about the, the night in January, typically, where the temperature drops really, really low. Um, uh, so that one night, that one coldest temperature of the year. That can be important for a variety of species in determining whether or not they can live in a location, right? And so there's a change in these his, uh, historical minimums to the projected minimums. If you look at the end of the century, it's, it's particularly dramatic, but um, you can pick any time period and you'll see a change that goes basically on this pattern here where the farther north you get, the faster we expect that that coldest temperature is going to warm. Um, and so we can think about many different species that this might have implications for, but this is an example of an extreme changing quickly, changing faster than the, than the average, that's going to be uh, biologically important. Um, so I'm going to give you an example now of a species that, um, that you have a lot more of here than we have in Indiana, but in Indiana it's a... Um, it's sort of a uh, iconic species in a way. So um, this is my son. Um, he's in Turkey Run State Park. Um, there are these nice sandstone cliffs here. And along the edges of these cliffs, you see these green trees. Any of you really good can squint and identify what those are? Have any clue what they might be? Yeah, it's hemlock, exactly. So we hardly have any of them in Indiana, um, but we do have them in, uh, along the edges of these sandstone cliffs uh, in our state parks, and they're, they're beautiful. Um, and the issue is that 
we're worried that we might get hemlock woolly adelgids coming in and um, basically uh, knocking out these species. So we don't want these little tiny insects on our trees. Um, we don't want to experience the thing that's been happening in, in this part of the world, in some, some areas in this part of the world where those trees are dying on a, on a large basis. And those insects are, uh, their range is regulated to some extent by the coldest temperature of the year. Um, we know they have a certain tolerance for, for cold temperatures. Um, and we know that, uh, so well, on this slide, here's the, the range of the hemlocks is shown in this hatched area. And we have a little, a few little patches in Indiana, but obviously much more out here. Um, areas where the temperatures have uh, historically gone below this sort of threshold for the woolly adelgid um, are in gray. In the future, areas that are projected to go below this threshold are in red. And so the idea is that the area that's protected by cold temperatures from these adelgids is on the retreat. Um, and areas that have historically been protected, like our state parks in Indiana, are unlikely to be protected in the future. And you can see there's you know, big shifts in, in this region of the world as well. We're also seeing changes in plant hardiness zone, which is really determined by that coldest temperature of the year. Um, we've already seen a shift in the plant hardiness zones um, that calculated here. And at the same time, so, so that's gonna affect what plants can grow in a given location. And at the same time, we're seeing a lengthening of the growing season, a lengthening of the frost-free season. So this is data from, from where I am in Indiana, but you see similar uh, similar changes around here. Historically, uh, in uh, Indiana, in Tippecanoe County, where I live, um, we have a growing season that lasts 173 days. Um, we're expecting it to be basically a month longer by the um, middle of the century uh, in in our region. And and whether it's the whether we look at a medium emission scenario or a high emission scenario, the the difference isn't that great. You know, we're either way we're about a month longer growing season by the middle of the century. So that's um, that's a substantial change that we need to need to be ready for. It's going to affect. Um, when plants are active, it's going to, and that's going to affect competition among plant species, um, and it's going to affect what species can can survive in a given location. Um, the upshot of this is that um, from work that uh, Jenica Allen has done, who's right here, um, and many of you may know her, um, uh, along with with Bethany uh, Bradley, who introduced me, that there are a lot more invasive species that are likely to be able to survive. Um, in this part of the country. Now, that may not be true for other parts of the country, but lucky you, you're here in the red area of the map in the Northeast. Um, and so that means you've got to be paying attention to what, uh, what's likely to be shifting what to many more species that, that might be able to come in. Uh, so Basically, the, the take home here is that the, there are more invasive species that are going to be able to survive here, more insect populations are going to be able to survive here, uh, and the populations are going to grow faster. I didn't go into that, but that's another uh, sort of upshot of warmer conditions. Um, another issue with this, with the changing growing seasons, is that invasive plants basically are known to, to track and be able to take advantage of climate change better than native species in many cases, and specifically here in the Northeast and in New England. So just one example from the right-hand side here, if you look at the amount of shift in flowering time of species uh, that has occurred over the last century or so, um, you see that basically invasive species, if you, if you look at species that are categorized as invasive and compare them with native species, the invasive species are shifting their flowering time to match the, the lengthening growing season, the earlier springs, much more successfully than the native species. So invasive plant species in this area are adjusting faster. And that 
potentially and, and probably in real life gives them a competitive advantage because the species that are adjusting their flowering times faster in this part of the world are not disappearing as some of the ones that are not adjusting their flowering time are disappearing in this part of the world. Um, so, so that's a concern right there. Then on the other end of the growing season, at the end uh, in, in the autumn, um, if you look at the, the shrubs around here, the invasive shrubs are the ones that are really benefiting from a lengthening of the growing season at the end of the year. They're, they tend to remain green, essentially, and, and photosynthet photosynthetic um, later into the growing season here um, than, the, than the native species do on average, which gives them the potential to basically um, stock up more carbon um, at the end of the year and, and grow faster. So the, the invasive shrubs or basically or the non-native shrubs are, are better poised to uh, take advantage of a longer growing season in this part of the country. So uh, around here invasives tend to respond more to warming temperatures and that favors them at the expense of natives. An important concept um, I think in this whole issue is the, the concept of the velocity of climate change. Um, how many of you have not heard of the velocity of climate change before? I want to just get a sense as to, so, okay, good. There's some people, I don't want to bore everybody. Thank you. Um, so the, this concept is just the idea that um, if you need, if you pr need a particular climate to survive in, um, under climate change, essentially, that climate is moving across the landscape somewhere, right? It's the climate that's here in Massachusetts today is going to be north of here tomorrow, essentially, as it warms up. And we will inherit the climate of, you know, Washington, D.C. or somewhere to the south as it warms up, just like you saw the state outline of Indiana moving south, basically. The climates are, are moving north. And the climate velocity concept just says, as an organism with certain climatic requirements, how fast would you have to move across the landscape to keep up with your climate as it moves to the north, right? And so if you live in a really flat area and the climate where the climate is changing really quickly, then you're gonna have to go really fast across the landscape. You're gonna have to shift your range quickly across the landscape to keep up with that climate. If you live in a mountainous area where you know, we know that on mountains, the temperatures get cooler as you go up uh, rapidly. Maybe you don't have to move as far because you just move up a little way. So this is looking at the lateral movement that a population would need to achieve to, to keep up with uh, the shift in temperature in this case. And so um, here we're looking at uh, how climate velocity shifts across the landscape. And, Climate velocity is important um, in thinking about what species can potentially keep up with, with this um, and what species are going to be disadvantaged. And um, basically the idea is that warming is happening rapidly. You can look at climate velocities and they're often around a kilometer per year um, in, in some regions. Um, in some parts of the Northeast, it can be a little bit slower where it's more mountainous. But the fast moving species are going to be um, advantaged by this. And so uh, native systems, native species that have some of these traits, a long juvenile period, a long lifespan, a little dispersal, are likely to be disadvantaged by a change in climate. Um, and if, if they are basically not uh, growing as well, well, potentially they won't compete as well against invasive species in the future. Uh, we don't know exactly how these communities are going to reorganize, but, um, but they could be disadvantaged. At the same time, we know that many invasives are really good, almost by definition, at moving rapidly across the landscape. So some of them have short juvenile period or long distance dispersal, or they just, we know they interact with people like the ornamental plants that are already distributed uh, well outside the range that you'd expect them to grow in by nurseries. Um, Many invasive species and, and families of invasive species have relatively, oh, oh, sorry, many invasive species within families have relatively broad climate tolerance um, and a lack of, of specialist mutualisms. All these things might help them um, uh, do well across a wide range of climates. Um, and 
invasives, many of them at least, are also well adapted to some of the extreme climatic events that we might get, some of the big storms and things like that. Invasives tend to be able to um, recover from disturbance really rapidly. And this is speaking in generalities, but, it's, um, but there are many cases where that's true. Uh, in general, we expect that invasive species are more responsive to CO2 than, uh, than non-invasive species. Uh, and this is, um, again, speaking in generalities, I'm not going to show you the meta-analysis results that suggest this, but there are analyses that, that do give us evidence for this. Um, so they may become more problematic in the future, may become harder to kill, that sort of thing. Um, so natives are also going to benefit from some from elevated CO2, native plants, um, uh, but invasives seem to benefit uh, more in many cases. One other concept that's just wor worth thinking about, I think, is that, um, that changes in climate can also indirectly affect how important an invasion is by affecting the thing that you're trying to protect. So I'm going to give you one example that may or may not be a, a um, sort of perfectly grounded in reality. I know tamarix and its effects are a little bit controversial, but um, it's, this is a, a shrub species in the southwest that is thought to use more water than native species, and it forms thickets on the edges of, of rivers. Um, in a warming and drying climate of the southwest, water becomes more and more valuable. And so suddenly the impact of tamarix, if it is indeed using more water than the natives, that impact becomes more important because the water itself has increased in value, even if the tamarix isn't favored by that change. All right, so what? Um, so what does this actually mean for, for you in real life if you're trying to, to manage a landscape? What should you be thinking about? And I, I shamelessly stole this slide from Bethany's presentation last year. So if you were here last year, I apologize. You're seeing this again, but they're good points. Um, so first off, um, for many of the species around here, warming is going to allow invasive species to grow earlier, to flower earlier, to survive later in the season and to benefit more from the, from the warmer uh, uh, autumn temperatures. So that may mean that you want to shift your monitoring times and shift your, the times at which you're trying to control these species. And there may be opportunities to control invasive species when few other species have leaked out or uh, are, are really uh, going to be harmed by some of the treatments that you might do. Um, Species ranges are shifting, ranges of many species are shifting, so that means you want to basically be talking to your neighbors, right, and, and letting people know when you see new species out there on the landscape and coordinating a lot. Basically, more communication will become more important because you can't just expect a static suite of invasives in any given spot. Um, more disturbance could mean more need for restoration because you want to protect your biotic resistance, you want to protect and make sure you have a robust native community that's there to to minimize the, the chances that you'll have uh, species coming in after disturbance that you don't want to persist. Um, and then in some cases, this increase in CO2 concentrations is um, gonna benefit plant species in ways that makes them harder to control. For instance, the plants may allocate more carbon to their roots, grow their roots faster, and that may mean that they have more reserves. So if you hit them with an herbicide, they don't, uh, they don't recover, or sorry, they, they don't die as quickly. Um, so, uh, so you may need to basically increase application rates of some, some herbicides. Um, and that will probably end up being trial and error, but it's something to, to look out for. So that's what I've got. I might have 30 seconds for questions. Thanks for listening, um, and thanks for inviting me.